Well, here we go. This is going to be a little different, but we're making the best of this situation. I've got in front of me my Bible. Hopefully you have read the passage of 1 Peter 1 through 12 already. And I just want to walk through the passage together and kind of highlight some things and then your discussions that will take place later will hopefully help you apply these truths to your lives and give you confidence and give you hope. So Peter has written a letter to God's elect, those who are followers of Jesus, but are yet scattered and living as exiles, living as strangers. And we'll get into that in a couple of weeks. But as you discuss that, Jesus is the center of this. Verse 3 through verse 12 is actually, in the original language as it was written, one sentence, one continuous sentence. And it starts out, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then it goes on and explains all of the reasons to praise Him, all of the reasons to give Him glory, all of the reasons that we worship Him and that we have confidence and hope. The first thing is that he talks about having a new birth into a living hope. A new birth gives you a new identity. Think about your birth. You had nothing to do with it, yet it gives you an identity. Your birth defines you. And you may not like that, and you may struggle against that, or you might be shaped very much by it. But your birth defines you. He's given us new birth into a living hope. What's a living hope? Is that just a vague wish? Like, I hope that the Steelers win the Super Bowl. Well, that's a worthless hope because they lost. I hope they at least beat the Browns. Once again, terrible. It's been a bad season, guys. It's not a hope like that. It's not a hope of, I hope we have pizza for dinner tonight or yesterday or whenever. It's not that kind of thing. This hope, this living hope is a confidence an absolute certainty that Peter grounds, if you look at your Bibles, that Peter grounds in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It lasts. It lasts. It is a confidence that we can have. This hope gives us confidence. And it says, then he goes on, this is an inheritance then that we get. Something that we inherit is something that's packed onto us, um, kind of like this identity from our birth. But it might be riches, it might be wealth, it might be a new car, it might be your inheritance is something that is given to you that belonged to someone else. But this inheritance in Christ doesn't perish, spoil, or fade. Let me give you an example. What are things that perish, spoil, and fade? Perish would be things that die. Spoiling, I think we know what that is. I'm here in the youth center, and it's been a while. So we're going to take a little trip right now to the refrigerator. Let's see things that maybe spoil. First of all, I'm not sure what's in here. There's not a lot right now, but we have ranch dressing. I don't know if you can see this. It's probably backwards. August 21st, 2019. And why we have three big jugs. Oh, here's another one. And a fourth jug of ranch dressing. I have no idea. But these things spoil milk. See the date? August 3rd. Should I try it? Oh my goodness, I just made a noise. And like, oh, if you could only smell this, this is curdling and awful. And I, I think it might actually be cheese. And I'm not sure why it's still in the fridge with an August 3rd date. But the things that perish, the things that spoil, the things that fade, that's not the hope that we have in Jesus. The hope we have in Jesus will never perish, spoil, or fade. It's kept in heaven for us. Things that perish are the things that die. The things that spoil are the things that get gross, like that milk that I just smelled. And things that fade are really hard to see. Because when it, you know, you know something that looks like it fades, the color fades, or the words fade, you can't, you can't read things anymore. We have confidence because of this birth, this living hope that we have. There's another kind of confidence that we can have that gives us hope and joy. And this confidence is through trials. Trials reveal what's true about us. Trials reveal the things that are true. Here's what the passage says. 
Um, these have come, these trials have come, in verse 7, so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire. So I've got some fire here. Paper will not last. Paper will be burned by the fire. Okay, this is probably a good idea inside, but I'll stomp it out. There we go. If the youth center isn't standing after right now, you'll know why. Now here is a Snickers bar. Will it last? It also perishes. It gets burned up. The plastic melts onto it. And it drips onto the table. Okay, that's going to be bad. So Somebody, one of you guys would try that, I'm sure. Here's another thing. Now, Sprite isn't necessarily good, and it's not um, something worthwhile, but because it's made of metal, it might turn a different color, but what's inside is going to last. What's inside is secure. And we could wrap it in paper, and all of the bad stuff, all the paper would burn off of it, but these trials come, the fire comes, so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may reveal, may result in praise, glory, and honor when who is revealed? When Jesus is revealed. All of the things of life when we go through struggles and trials kind of burn away. And what we're left with is that solid hope and joy that we have in Jesus. Let me give you an example. When I was in college, I moved from Pennsylvania to Indiana, and it was really early on. I got made fun of so bad. I said a few words in my life that I had no idea that I said funny. Let me give you a couple, and see if you can even figure out what I'm saying. Keller. The word Keller. The word Mal. The word Crick. Those are three words that I said a lot, that I grew up thinking they were perfectly normal. And the moment I started to say them in college, my roommates would mock me. <laughs> they would make fun of me. They're like, Keller? Like Helen Keller? Keller, what's a Keller? I'm like, no, like red. Like green, like blue, you know, Kellers. And I would talk about going um, two mile down the road. And people would be like, what's a mile? I had a friend visit me once and my mom was talking and he's like, what is she saying? What's a mile? And then Crick. Crick is probably going to stick with me for a long time, but in Pennsylvania, in the hills, it's another way to say creek, the Crick. And so I got made fun of so much in college that I got, I kind of got embarrassed, and I decided, I think I need to change. And so I changed because I was wrong, or I said things weird, and because it didn't matter. But the question for us is, when we have hope in Jesus, and the trials come, and we get mocked, and we get made fun of, and we get persecuted, what if you're mocked for your faith? If you change, maybe, maybe it wasn't real to you in the first place. The fire reveals the fire, remember this? The fire will reveal what you truly believe. But what's left over after the fire is joy. Now, not joy because of suffering. Not joy for the suffering, rather, I should say. But joy because of suffering. It's because of the suffering that reveals what's really true and what's good. And so it gives us confidence. See, when your joy is rooted in money, when your joy might be rooted in relationships, whether that's friends or whether that's like a love interest, when your joy is rooted in your skills or your smarts or your grades or your athletic ability, when your joy is rooted in popularity, when your joy is in your present circumstances, those are the things that burn up. But Peter says your salvation, your identity in Christ is your hope. And that will survive the fire. The hope in Christ survives the fire if it's true about you. This is what Peter's leading us to do and so that we can then have hope and joy in Christ. We can have confidence. We can have confidence. We can have confidence in this new identity. We can have confidence because of suffering. And we can have confidence. These last few verses, verses 10 to 12, you can read them, you already have, but... This salvation, it came through the prophets of the Old Testament. 
They wrote what is true because our hope and joy is rooted in what is true. Our hope and joy is rooted in the scriptures, the scriptures that are true. We have a true identity. We have a true faith that is tested by fire. And we have the true scriptures. And this gives us confidence, especially going back to verse 1, especially as we are a people chosen by God, you have put your faith and your trust in him who are then scattered and living in a world and living in a culture and living among people, neighbors, friends at school who don't understand, who don't believe. And so when the testing comes, our faith is proved genuine. And much like that Snickers, the paper, even the gross milk, those things, the money, the relationships, all of those things, your present circumstances, those are the things that perish, spoil, and fade, especially when trials come. You've got a whole bunch of questions to talk about, things to discuss. But I want to leave you with what is your hope and joy rooted in? Is it rooted in the temporary things of this life, or is it rooted in your true identity in Christ, in your true faith, your salvation through Jesus? And is it rooted in the scriptures? Thanks for listening. Have some great conversations. I have some milk to dump out because that stinks.